Okay, well, hello and welcome back. Uh, this will be lecture three uh, on chapter 14, the cardiovascular system. Uh, you're probably going to get a little more than you bargained for from me on chapter 14, but trust me, it'll pay us huge dividends uh, down the road when we uh, expand on the cardiovascular system. What I'd like to do today, uh, list the goals for you here. I'd like to cover the cellular basis of cardiac muscle cell contraction. Uh, correlate that uh, contraction with the myocardial action potential so that you can see the relationship, how one leads to the other. When the cells depolarize and repolarize, that results in a, a rise in intracellular calcium and contraction. So we'll correlate those things. Uh, secondly, in expanding on that, I want to talk about why cardiac muscle cells do not exhibit tetany. Uh, if they did, it would result in death. So we definitely do not want cardiac cells to exhibit Tetany. We'll go ahead and talk about the underlying mechanism for that. Uh, it's important not just to understand that um, it, they don't exhibit tetany so that the cells can cannot die, but it also explains the underlying function of cardiac muscle cells as well. So it's it has multiple reasons. We ha I have multiple reasons for going over that. And then finally, I want to talk about the cellular basis uh, of autorhythmicity uh, in the heart uh, and explain where the sinus rhythm, uh, where it arises, the underlying mechanism for it. Um, again, these lectures, um, you'll probably get more than uh, two per week. And it's not that I'm trying to drown you in information, but I'm trying to package the material in such a way that it, it, it makes some sense as a unit. So these topics that I'll be covering today, when I finish that and then, and then wrap that up, when I go to lecture four, I'll begin covering the cardiac cycle, uh, and I'll correlate, for example, the electrocardiogram uh, with volume and pressure changes and so forth that take place uh, during a, a contraction relaxation cycle uh, in the heart. So, at any rate, hopefully, it'll it'll um, um, the packages will make more sense to you and make make it more useful to study it that way uh, as well. Okay, all right. So uh, the cellular basis for um, uh, cardiac muscle cell contraction. I can get my computer to respond here. There we go. This is uh, figure 1410 in our text. And we've kind of started to talk a little bit about this last time when I went through the action potential for a ventricular muscle cell. At any rate, <clears throat> uh, she has listed this in a stepwise fashion for us, which make, makes it really useful for study and, and discussion. Uh, I want to point out, though, that uh, up here at the top, she's got number one, action potential arises from a, or arrives from a neighboring cell. Remember in skeletal muscle cells, uh, it's uh, motor neurons that stimulate the muscles to contract. The motor neurons release acetylcholine that depolarizes the membrane, brings it to threshold and generates an action potential, which then spreads across the sarcolemma uh, and causes a, a, a rise in intracellular calcium and, and therefore contraction. Similarly, in cardiac muscle cells, we have an action potential that spreads across the, uh, the sarcolemma, but it arises ultimately in the sinoatrial node, and I'll explain how that arises shortly. But as the membrane depolarizes and the action potential is propagated along its surface, uh, you'll have a sequential opening of voltage-gated sodium channels and then potassium channels, which cause the repolarization. So, as the action potential is propagated across the membrane and down through the T-tubular system in a, in a cardiac muscle cell, it depolarizes a region of the membrane which possesses voltage-gated calcium channels. Now, uh, again, calcium uh, is, is much higher outside the cell than it is in. In fact, in general biology, they might have told you that the intracellular calcium was zero. That's not really true. Uh, it's almost zero in the cytoplasm, but it's pretty high in intracellular organelles like the sarcoplasmic reticulum, endoplasmic reticulum uh, of all cells. Nevertheless, uh, calcium is about 10,000 fold higher outside the typical cell than it is in. So when the membrane depolarizes, when an action potential spreads down the membrane, I'm moving my arrow here past this, it will cause a conformational change in a voltage regulated calcium channel. And again, the little cartoon here is just showing some sort of a gating mechanism where you know it can open up and then you've got a door that'll like close 
and, and terminate the influx of calcium. This calcium channel has a couple different names like everything else in biology. Um, she refers to it as an L-type calcium channel. It's called L-type because it's long acting. It's, uh, it's the, the channel is relatively slow to open and slow to close. That's important to appreciate because it will help us to better understand refractory periods in cardiac muscle and why uh, the cells do not exhibit tetany. It also is named after a chemical which inhibits uh, this particular channel called a dihydropyridine. Uh, it's a plant compound. And in most physiology textbooks, you'll see this list described as a dihydropyridine receptor. Uh, because it binds dihydropyridines and, and it blocks the channel. It's a tool that investigators use to analyze uh, calcium influx across, across the membrane. I give you that because in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, the calcium channel here, she points out, is a ryanodine receptor. So to complete the story, um, if you go on and take any uh, other physiology courses, they'll talk about dihydropyridine receptors in the plasma membrane, ryanodine receptors in the sarcoplasmic reticulum membrane. Okay, so that's just a little bit of nomenclature, but uh, we depolarize the membrane, the channel opens, the calcium diffuses down this huge concentration gradient. Some of that calcium will contribute to contraction, but the T-tubules abut or are very, very close to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. The influx of the calcium that takes place physically causes a channel called the ryanodine receptor channel to open. The calcium is much higher in the sarcoplasmic reticulum than in the cytosols I've indicated before. So it simply diffuses out. This is referred to as calcium-induced calcium release. So we've got calcium in the cytosol, both from the extracellular fluids, as well as from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Now in cardiac muscle cells, uh, a vast majority of the calcium that promotes contraction does come from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. She points out it's like 90%. But it's still not sufficient to give a maximal uh, myocardial contraction. Teleologically, we need an additional source of calcium and that comes from the extracellular fluids. So again, uh, this huge concentration gradient outside the cell, when the channel opens, the calcium diffuses down its gradient into the cell. It simultaneously promotes release from the SR, and then it adds to the calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum to promote contraction. These calcium sparks that are being referred to in the cartoon here, um, in, the, in the research laboratory, they can monitor the efflux of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum using uh, fluorescence. And when they do that, mm -hmm. they get this literally a flash of light. So it's a fluorescent signal. The investigators, when they saw that, they said, eh, let's call it a calcium spark. So when the investigators communicate with each other about calcium sparks, that's, that's basically what they're referring to. She's got multiple arrows here to indicate that there's a summation of the calcium. This binds to troponin in the contractile machinery and promotes contraction. I won't go through the molecular details of the sliding uh, filament mechanism with you. Just understand that when calcium levels rise, binds to troponin, induces contraction. The calcium is going to be sequestered continuously. So when the calcium levels fall to below critical levels, the calcium disengages or unbinds, as she likes to say, from the contractile machinery protein of troponin and the sliding filaments basically come apart and relax. These T-tubules uh, are much bigger in diameter um, and than you would observe in skeletal muscle. The reason I took the time to point that out to you is to emphasize to you again that calcium from the extracellular fluid is necessary to promote a full optimal myocardial contraction to generate sufficient force. So uh, structure dictates function again. So we have a larger T-tubule with a larger cross-sectional, or with a, with a larger surface area, sorry, and more of these voltage-gated calcium channels, which can, when they are activated, allow more calcium to diffuse into the cell. Uh, again, I want to remind you, they're only showing one of these channels here for the sake of just keeping the, the cartoon from getting cluttered, but there's many of these that would reside within the T-tubular system of these cells, okay?
The calcium, uh, even though it's, it's moving from the outside to the inside of the cell, from the sarcoplasmic reticulum to the uh, out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum to the cytosol, it's continually being removed. Some of it is being pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum simultaneously while it's being released, and some of it's being exported out of the cell. Now again, how does it know <laughs> when to induce a contraction? Well, when the depolarization allows a large influx from the outside and induces calcium release, that overrides any that's being sequestered simultaneously. So you get a transient rise in calcium from these summated sparks and you get contraction. But again, it's continually being taken back up into the SR. These are active calcium transporters. They need teleologically to be active because the calcium is in higher concentration inside the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So one needs the energy to drive the calcium uphill. That's achieved by the hydrolysis of ATP. Similarly, because the calcium is high outside the cell, teleologically, we need some way of moving it uphill. Now remember, it's about 10,000 times higher outside than it is in. So there are calcium exchangers in this case, coupled to the sodium potassium pump. Recall the sodium potassium pump maintains the high extracellular sodium, high intracellular potassium ion concentration gradients. The sodium calcium exchanger takes advantage of that and moves the calcium out for the sodium going in. Now, this is not a primary active transporter, it's a secondary active transporter. The primary one is the one that hydrolyzes the ATP. But I wanna point out to you here something that, that is really uh, actually uh, uh, important. The stoichiometry of this reaction is three sodiums to one calcium. If you take a, an exchanger that only moves one sodium and one calcium, if you compare that with one that'll pump or, or exchange two sodiums for one calcium, it increases the ability teleologically to concentrate the calcium outside about 10,000 times. When you have one that, that has a stoichiometry of three to one, it's just hundreds of thousands of times. So simply by having a three to one stoichiometry, the ability of this transporter to move the calcium to the outside is just simply enormous. So again, it's an exchange of sodium for calcium. The sodium gradient is maintained by the sodium potassium pump. Okay? I detailed these names to you before, or, or I explained them before, but I typed them out down below so that you could have a reference. Uh, RYR, you'll see that in any textbook, that's the ryanidine receptor. The L-type is also called a dihydropyridine receptor. And again, both these chemical compounds tend to inhibit these channels. So they can be used for research purposes. They could obviously be used for clinical purposes too. And we'll get, get to a little bit more of, of that down the road, okay? All right. <clears throat> You've seen this action potential already uh, in lecture two. I went through the underlying basis of action potential uh, and compared action potentials in nerves and skeletal muscles with cardiac muscles. This is an action potential for a ventricular muscle cell. So all I did was take that and paste it next to this diagram. I, I use this as a tool to correlate the action potential with what's going on over here to induce contraction. So, the increased sodium, that's happening up here when the membrane exhibits action potentials that are propagated through its membrane. As it depolarizes, it opens up the L-type calcium channel, and that's what contributes to this plateau, a large part of this plateau. And again, it's an L-type, so it's long-acting, slow to open, slow to close. Uh, you can see over here a ventricular muscle cell might have a depolarization phase of a couple of hundred milliseconds. Part of the reason for that is the slowness of the opening and closing of the L-type uh, calcium channel. When they do close, and the membrane exhibits increased permeability to potassium, decreased permeability to sodium, the membrane will simply repolarize. And again, that's labeled very nicely for us uh, on this diagram or on this graph. 
Okay, now, the second goal today was to explain uh, why cardiac muscle cells uh, don't exhibit tetany. Why, why, don't, why don't they exhibit tetany? A nice, you know, steady force of contraction. Well, if they did that, there wouldn't be sufficient time to fill the heart with blood, and there wouldn't be sufficient time to eject blood from the heart. Cardiac output would diminish, uh, and we would be, we would be dead in, in no time at all. Now, to explain this, what I want to do first is explain what tetany is. So I'm going to take the bottom figure, since skeletal muscle exhibits tetany and cardiac muscle doesn't, and explain, use that to explain tetany first. On the left side here, we've got a graph that shows the action potential in a skeletal muscle cell and the corresponding force of contraction that takes place in a muscle as a consequence of the action potential. So I've got membrane potential on the y-axis for the action potential, tension in skeletal muscle on the right side to, de to describe the contraction and relaxation. And all this is taking place through time. Now an action potential in a skeletal muscle cell takes place in about a thousand or a few thousandths of a second. It's very fast. The cell, and that's what we're showing here, the cell depolarizes and then quickly repolarizes back down. You'll notice though that the actual contraction doesn't begin until the membrane has almost come all the way back down to its resting level. And then it's prolonged for many, you know, maybe a, in this particular cartoon here, maybe a hundred milliseconds. This would be an example of a skeletal muscle twitch. The action potential is over long before the contraction ever reaches its maximal force of contract, force of tension. The action potential induces the release of calcium from intracellular stores in the skeletal muscle cell, the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So that promotes the contraction. And again, it takes place long after the action potential has come back down to its resting level. What this means is that if the action potential has come back down to its resting level while the muscle is still contracting as it's doing here, then you can stimulate it again and get another action potential. So in other words, here's an action potential I could have, if this is the first one, I could have two, three, four, five in rapid succession. And that's what she's illustrated on the right-hand side here. This is tension in a skeletal muscle preparation in response to very rapid stimulation through time. So the tension before the muscle can relax, it's stimulated again. That tension adds in a summated manner. If we keep increasing the stimulus intensity, the frequency, I'm sorry, you'll reach a point where you'll get a maximum level of contraction, a titanic state of contraction. And again, you can illustrate this by simply taking a heavy weight, uh, a barbell, maybe 50 pounds, holding it out at your waist and just holding on to it. A lot of those muscle cells will be in a tonic state of contraction, tetany. And again, we can't have cardiac muscles do that because they wouldn't fill with blood, the cardiac uh, output would diminish and, and cells would die. So. Let me go back, uh, oops, wait, oh, one thing I wanted to do for you here was to explain the underlying basis uh, of this refractory period. Let me back up here. Um, the stimulus is applied at this point right here. The membrane depolarizes and then repolarizes back down to its resting level. Now, while the membrane is depolarizing like this, you can't stimulate it again to add to a higher level of depolarization. The membrane is refractory. It won't respond to another stimulus during this time period. Now, why won't the membrane respond during this refractory period? Well, now last time when I went through an action potential with you, I gave you some cartoons to illustrate. This is the same figures that I gave you before. I said during an action potential, <clears throat> when the membrane is depolarized, there's a sodium voltage gated channel that opens. It allows sodium to diffuse through the membrane to the inside of the cell. That's what provides that uh, upward depolarization phase. And then the sodium channel closes. That puts a limit on the extent of the depolarization. While it's depolarizing, it opens up a potassium channel 
and the potassium moves out. Again, let me just back up here. Sodium channel is open, depolarizes. Sodium channel closes, potassium channel opens, the membrane and the membrane repolarizes, okay? Now, until these channels revert back to their original conformation, the membrane can't be reactivated. A ridiculous thing to say here and simple thing to say would have, I can't open a door unless it's closed. <laughs> uh, if, if I open the door and leave it open, I can't open it again until I close it. It has to go back to its original conformation. That's an oversimplification, but basically it's what's happening during an action potential. Until these channels, and that's why I pasted the arrows up above, this is a sequence of events. Think of this as one, two, and three. You activate the membrane, it depolarizes to threshold, the sodium channels open, you get a maximum upsweep in the action potential, the spike. The sodium channels close, that puts a limit on the upward depolarization. Simultaneously, the potassium channel opens, that allows the potassium to move out and the cell repolarizes. But until this channel reorients itself to this initial state, until the potassium channel reorients itself to this initial state, the membrane can't be reactivated. So that's what you see here, that, that shaded yellow. The channels have not reoriented themselves so that the membrane can be reactivated again. Now, as the membrane repolarizes back down to almost its resting level, then it enters a period where it can be reactivated. We call it a relative refractory period, as opposed to an absolute refractory period. It's relative because if you apply a big enough stimulus, you can reactivate the cell. That's what we're seeing over here. When they stimulate the cell and get an arbitrary level of tension being generated, if they quickly stimulate it again, the membrane depolarizes, you get additional calcium released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. One way to look at this is that when you stimulate it the second and the third time, there's still calcium remaining from the previous stimuli. So you're adding calcium to it each time you do that. And you can see here with increasing, with ramping up the frequency, the contractions start to add up. They sum up on each other because the calcium just keeps building up until finally you get a maximal force, a tonic or tetanic state of contraction. Okay. That's the skeletal muscle below. We compare it now with cardiac muscle. Cardiac muscle, remember the action potential. In this case, we've got one that's about 250 milliseconds long. Cell depolarizes the threshold. We get this upsweep due to the influx of sodium. Starts to repolarize, but these L-type calcium channels give us this plateau until they eventually close. And then the cell begins to repolarize because the potassium is leaving, there's no sodium coming in, and it comes back down to the resting level. Okay. It's during this prolonged action potential. Remember, a skeletal muscle melt cell might be one, two, three milliseconds. A ventricular muscle cell is hundreds of times longer than that. All during most of the depolarization phase, the cell is refractory. The channels have not reoriented themselves so that they can be reactivated again. So, we first get this maximum upsweep like this. The L-type calcium channels are open. We have calcium coming in from the outside as well as the sarcoplasmic reticulum, so the contraction begins. And it ramps up and ramps up and ramps up because we've got this L-type calcium channel that's open, allowing the calcium to continue moving into the cell, promoting calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. It's not until the cell repolarizes almost back down to its resting level, and I put a dashed line through here, put some marks on here to draw your attention to this where I've said note, okay? It's not until the membrane is almost back down to its resting level that it can be reactivated again. And again, the reason that it can be activated again is because 
the sodium voltage gated channel, the potassium voltage gated channel, the calcium voltage gated channel, all of those channels have reoriented themselves such that they can be reactivated again. So during this couple of hundred, 250 milliseconds, even if you were to stimulate the cell again, you would not get another, um, you wouldn't summate the action potentials and you would not summate the force of contraction. So when you look at a cardiac muscle cell tension during, during a contraction relaxation cycle, this is the original one here, zero to 250. Basically what the author has done is copied this over here, this first one. And then they said, what if we were to repeat uh, or increase the stimulus intensity, the frequency? Nothing happens. You stimulate it once, you'll get this tension that'll last 250 milliseconds. If you were to apply stimuli with increasing frequency here, nothing would happen. The cell must repolarize almost back to its resting level before it can be reactivated. Critical for proper functioning of cardiac muscle. The heart must have a prolonged period of relaxation to fill with blood. It must have a prolonged contraction, in this case, maybe two to 300 milliseconds, in order to be able teleologically to provide the force, the tension, to eject perhaps 70, 80, 90 mils of blood during a single cardiac cycle. So no tetany in cardiac muscle. Okay. okay, now the final thing I wanna talk about today is um, the sinus rhythm, or quite simply, um, how, does the, or how, or how does the heart beat arise? How does it arise? And I've told you before that uh, cardiac muscle, uh, you can cut all the afferent, efferent nerves to it, and it'll continue to beat. If you maintain it in a proper environment, it can beat for a long time. The autorhythmicity of the sinoatrial node, this is where, uh, the, this produces the electrical signal, which then is propagated throughout the heart, uh, leading to myocardial contraction. Because it originates in the SA node, we always call the SA node the pacemaker of the heart. Other cells have pacemaker ability, but they're much slower. They're very unreliable, um, meaning that they're not consistent. So a proper functioning sinoatrial node is essential to cardiac physiology. I pulled this cartoon uh, of the heart and its conducting system just to kind of set the stage for this. Uh, the sinoatrial node resides or is located right where the superior vena cava um, uh, attaches to the right atrium, right into the entrance, in the entry pathway there. Once the signal is generated in the SA node, it'll be propagated through conducting fibers, as well as the myocardial cells through the gap junctions throughout the atrial muscle mass. It'll then be propagated through the AV node and its conducting system, and finally the ventricular muscle. And again, I'll detail all of that for you. Uh, my goal today is only to explain the underlying um, the physiological basis for sinus rhythm. Okay, okay. Um, I pulled this figure again to illustrate uh, what I've been talking about. There's the SA node right there where the superior vena cave comes in. That's the right atrium or right oracle as it looks here, it looks like an ear flap. Um, the SA node cells this is where you're going to see the sinus rhythm generated, and then it'll be propagated through gap junctions. That's what she's representing with the arrows here. There's the intercalated disc. The gap junctions will allow the ions to move through the gaps into the subsequent cells. So once the electrical signal is generated in the SA node, it'll be propagated through the conducting system and muscle mass, and again, the tissue behaves as though it were a syncytium, and we call it a functional syncytium because it does indeed appear to function as, as a single unit. Now, <clears throat> I copied this, and then below it, I pasted some action potentials of a typical SA node cell and comparing it with ventricular muscle cells, which we've talked about quite a bit uh, already at length. So a ventricular or an atrial muscle cell, either one, they'll look very similar. There's, there are differences and I'll point those out to you. But uh, you would see a, a much more negative potential, a more prolonged depolarization phase in muscle cells than you will in the SA node. 
So <clears throat> let's just do a quick comparison here. <clears throat> the first thing you'll notice about the SA node cells, there's no resting membrane potential. These cells never come to rest. They're always depolarizing or repolarizing. You'll notice that the maximum negative potential of an SA node cell might be minus 60 or even less. It's much more than that in a ventricular or a, a, an atrial muscle cell. So the amplitude of the action potential is much greater in muscle than it is in the SA node cells. And of course, uh, again, you can see that the profiles look dim different. Uh, the timing, the dynamics with which these channels open and close differ uh, tremendously between these types of cells. So it's important to compare the action potentials uh, of the SA node cells with those of the uh, muscle cells, whether it be uh, atrial muscle cells or ventricular muscle cells. All right, let me back up. I, I pulled panel A off of this uh, collage of pictures that she has put together to, to illustrate the underlying basis for an action potential in an SA node cell. So uh, the question is, how do we generate this spontaneous depolarization, repolarization uh, in the SA node that we'll come to call the sinus rhythm? And then of course, how is that propagated throughout the muscle mass of the heart? Okay. This first panel again <clears throat> shows a typical uh, action potential on the SA node. The cells depolarize up to threshold. They exhibit a spike, a smaller spike, but nevertheless a spike, and then they repolarize. But they don't rest when they get back down to the maximum negative potential. They simply start depolarizing once again. So no resting potential, constant depolarization and repolarization. Now, even though we emphasize the SA node cells, other cells in the heart, as I indicated a few minutes ago, do have the potential uh, to spontaneously depolarize and repolarize. So in an experimental subject, a mammal, a, a research mammal like a rat or something like that, if you were to inactivate the SA node, what you would find in many cases is that the AV node would then take over and start depolarizing and repolarizing. If you did away with that, we can find even some of the conducting fibers in the ventricles can actually begin depolarizing and repolarizing on their own. Now, um, again, these fibers are, uh, they're much less reliable and inconsistent and they're much slower. So even if they were functioning optimally, optimally they will not provide a sufficient rhythm, uh, electrical rhythm for depolarization, repolarization, and therefore contraction, relaxation um, of the myocardium of the heart. So again, a normal SA node is essential. And again, it depolarizes and repolarizes at the fastest rate. Therefore, it's the pacemaker of the heart, okay? Now, I'm just copying this over so that I can, I can add some additional information to this for you. Let me first explain what we know about uh, an action potential in an SA node cell. Then I'll explain some of the, the terminology and the, the nomenclature, which uh, bear with me, it, it can get a little, a little heavy at times. So uh, this figure here is, it, it's an overview. It's a uh, kind of an icon, you know, to show you an action potential in an SA node cell. In the second figure in panel B, we begin to label um, what's responsible for the change in voltage. And again, I've said before that biological electricity is really nothing more than the flow of ions. So we want to explain the ionic basis really for an action potential in an SA node cell. Okay, so the second panel, same coordinates, same time, same everything else, okay? Uh, the cell in this case is depolarizing, as you can see, up to threshold. That's due principally to sodium. The predominant force is sodium moving into the cell. It's a little more complicated than that. But sodium moves in, when it attains threshold, it opens up a voltage-gated calcium channel, and you get an influx of calcium. The channels close, potassium channels open, similarly to what we've seen before, and the cell begins to repolarize. But when it gets down into this negative region, minus 50, minus 60 like this, instead of coming to rest, it simply starts depolarizing once again. What is occurring 
is that when the cell begins to move in this negative direction, uh, minus 20, 30, 40, 50, and down to around minus 60 like that, the, uh, this one potassium channel closes, but another channel is present, which is always leaky to sodium and potassium. And what happens is the cell just spontaneously starts to depolarize like this until it reaches threshold. And then again, we get a, an action potential, a smaller amplitude action potential, but one nonetheless. Now, the thing that increases the activity of this sodium influx is the very fact that the cell is hyperpolarizing. Now, again, let me repeat this for those of you that haven't had first semester. A cell that has a resting potential, or in this case, a cell that has a, a most negative membrane potential, if it moves in a less negative direction, we refer to that as depolarization. So anything from minus 60 up in this direction is depolarization. When it moves back down toward the negative direction, we call it hyperpolarization in general. It's just general terminology that we use. <clears throat> When the cell hyperpolarizes like this, it opens up a channel, increases the open probability of a channel that allows both sodium to move in and potassium to move out. And I know that seems like a paradox. Why don't they antagonize each other? The cell, remember, at minus 60 is, is, is about, a, if this cell is about as leaky to potassium as it's gonna get in that region right there. But when you increase the permeability of sodium, ah, that's different. Remember, we have a huge concentration for gradient for sodium across the cell. So even though it's leaking both sodium and potassium, the predominant force, and that's why she's labeled this here the way she has, you, the net force is net sodium in. So the cell depolarizes. So it's a hyperpolarization that's activated this massive influx of sodium that causes the cell to depolarize up to threshold. Because this channel is opened by hyperpolarization and not depolarization, the investigators, when they discovered this, they looked at each other and said, well, boy, that's funny. <laughs> I swear, <laughs> that's what happened. They looked at each other and said, well, that's funny. Uh, most channels open up in response to depolarization when you activate a cell. So these channels came to be called funny current channels and the currents as funny currents. That's why they call them that. So uh, the cell hyperpolarizes, that activates this funny current channel. You get a net influx of sodium. When it depolarizes sufficiently to threshold, it opens up calcium channels and you get this spike the depolarization closes the calcium channel. The potassium channels are open. The cell repolarizes. As it gets down in the more negative range, it activates the funny current channel and it just simply keeps recycling. Long ago, this used to be called the, the potassium decay hypothesis. Uh, the potassium, as it leaks out of the cell like this, it's basically what's activating this funny current channel down here, increasing its open probability and causing the cell to depolarize. Now we also know that these channels can be activated uh, by neurotransmitters, hormones, and guess what, drugs. Um, because they're activated by hyperpolarization, it's pretty obvious why they call them hyperpolarization activated channels. But, Hormones, neurotransmitters, and some drugs can bind to the cell membrane and change the intracellular levels of cyclic A, for example, cyclic AMP, a cyclic nucleotide. These can also regulate uh, the opening and closing uh, rate of these channels. So the channel got an extended name. Uh, a funny current, I sub F channel, is also called hyperpolarization activated cyclic nucleotide gated channel, HCN channels. There's, there's different isoforms of these channels. Now, I know that's a mouthful, so let me go through it slowly. It's a funny current channel because it's activated in response to hyperpolarization. Therefore, 
we can call it a hyperpolarization activated channel. Hyperpolarization activated, but in addition to that, it's activated by cyclic nucleotides. So it's a hyperpolarization activated, cyclic nucleotide gated channel. Both hyperpolarization and changes in cyclic nucleotides influence the opening and closing of these funny current channels. Why do you want to know something about that? Well, I added a few sentences this morning to try to, to give you a reason for wanting to, to, to study this. I've said this concept will be important when we discuss how the sympathetic nervous system increases pacemaker rate and parasympathetic nervous system decreases rate. In other words, heart rate is generated spontaneously within the SA node. How do we speed it up and slow it down? Well, when the sympathetic nervous system is activated, like during stress, it causes the rate <clears throat> of depolarization <clears throat> to be much steeper. So in it, you can see I'm tracing my arrow from here to here and then back. During sympathetic stimulation, it might do this. Bang, get an action potential. The number of action potentials per unit of time will increase in response to sympathetic stimulation because the sympathetic stimulation is increasing cyclic nucleotide levels and therefore increasing the rate of depolarization. The parasympathetic nervous system does just the opposite. So this will, as we'll see, this will help us to explain the underlying basis for how the sympathetic component of our nervous system increases heart rate and how the parasympathetic component decreases that. Okay. Okay. This last figure I put on, <clears throat> again, just simply to capture, uh, put this in context, there's the SA node. It's gonna generate an impulse, which is gonna be propagated through conducting fibers and myocardial cells through gap junctions. It'll activate the SA node. That'll, that'll activate the conducting system of the ventricular muscle system and activate the, the uh, muscle cells stimulating them to contract. On the right here is a, uh, a panel showing different profiles for action potentials. So an SA node, Again, kind of a slow action potential. In fact, we call them slow response fibers. Here's an atrial, a ventricular muscle cell action potential. You can see there's that sharp, massive upsweep depolarization phase. So they call them fast response fibers. The SA node looks similar to the SA node. And I'll explain why that is so and why that's important physiologically uh, next time. Okay. Um, that takes us to the end uh, of, of the, the goals for today. What I will do in lecture four, I'll pick up uh, where I term, terminated today. But what I'll begin to do is to um, correlate electrical activity during a single cardiac cycle, during a contraction relaxation phase, uh, follow the wave of electrical activity, starting in the SA node and proceeding throughout the conducting system and the myocardium. In other words, we're going to establish and look at a, an electrocardiogram tracing. And then we'll correlate that with volume and pressure changes that take place within the heart during a single cardiac cycle. So we're going to embark on a study of the cardiac cycle, both uh, in an electrical context, as well as uh, looking at pressure and volume changes. In other words, how much blood is ejected from the heart uh, if you increase heart rate? How does that affect uh, cardiac output and so forth? Okay, so I'm going to stop at this point. Uh, this will be the end of lecture three. Um, again, if you get this far, uh, I won't be here tomorrow, Tuesday. Uh, I doubt that anybody will get this far by tomorrow, but I will be in Thursday uh, and I'll uh, open up a Zoom discussion at 2.30 sharp. Uh, if you have any questions, and I certainly hope that you come with plenty of them. Uh, have a great day. Be safe. Please practice uh, the distancing measures that the university is uh, pushing. Uh, we certainly don't want to see any COVID outbreaks on campus here. And uh, have a great day, and I will see you soon.